So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Mark Mize from uh, Stony Brook University. He's working at the Simon Center of Geometry Physics. Recently, he, uh, he appointed as a long-term member of the uh, center. He did his PhD from MIT with Professor Hong Liu. And after that, he was a postdoc at Princeton University from 2014 to 17. And then from 17, he joined Stony Brook Simon Center for Geometry Physics. And his uh, expertise area is quantum field theory, quantum gravity, entanglement entropy, and quantum information theory related areas, and also string theory. And uh, he, today he is going to talk about a very interesting topic these days. Uh, we are very much excited about this topic, which is basically fine probes of quantum chaos. And uh, he will talk about that in detail. And uh, thank you, Mark for uh, accepting this invitation. And this is the 45th uh, Quantum Aspects of uh, Space-Time Seminar series. And you are welcome to give this talk and we all of us welcoming you from Potsdam. So you can start your talk. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I would like to reiterate that please stop me at any time. Uh, if you need, if you have a question or you need clarification. And uh, my apologies, but somehow my eye patch screen sharing doesn't work. Uh, so uh, I won't be able to write on the slides uh, as I plan to, but hopefully that uh, won't uh, uh, decrease the uh, quality of the talk too much. So my talk uh, title today is uh, Fine Probes of Quantum Chaos. And uh, this will be a summary talk of um, a research direction that I've been pursuing for the uh, last five years or so uh, with many collaborators uh, who are listed here. Okay, uh, so as an introduction, um, we will be discussing quantum chaotic dynamics. And there are, there's a variety of phenomena and signatures associated with chaotic dynamics. The tra transport of thermal starting from an out of equilibrium state, the quantum butterfly effect, the newly proposed signature of chaos, the pole skipping phenomenon, uh, the growth of co the complexity of the wave function or the time evolution operator, and historically, one of the first signatures of quantum chaos uh, was the statistics of energy eigenvalues and, and their correlations. Uh, and the so Mark, yes. uh, will you discuss about each and every one here? You will see. Uh, the ultimate goal uh, of uh, this research direction is to describe uh, these phenomena in a unified theory and clarify their connection. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, just, uh, but but the, the goal of this talk... I sorry. just want to... Uh, 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 sorry for the interruption. I really don't know about this thing, pole skipping. Can you a little bit explain? Yeah, so, so pole skipping will be my second topic. So I will be discussing three things, uh, uh, three okay, topics, okay. Uh, and in, in the order of butterfly effect for skipping and then thermalization. Okay. So the goal of this talk will be to develop effective descriptions uh, valid at long distances and at late times for some of these processes, and I told you which ones, okay. and then to study their interplay, and uh, finally to relate them to gravity through the ADS-CFD correspondence. And I'm assuming high energy background uh, throughout this talk, but if there are uh, people in the attendance, attending who, who have different backgrounds, then, then of course, uh, if I take something from gra for granted that you don't know, uh, then please stop me and I can explain. Um, okay, so here's the outline of the talk. I will start with the butterfly effect and uh, discuss how it's related to oper the growth of operators and out of time and correlation functions. And I was, um, as one of the highlights, I will show you a refinement of the famous chaos bound. Um, then I will discuss pole skipping and what 
its definition, uh, how it manifests itself away from maximal chaos, and uh, a technical nicety will be an explicit thermal Green's function in closed form in, in some strongly interacting system. And finally, I will uh, discuss thermalization, uh, starting from an out of equilibrium initial state, uh, which will probe with entanglement entropy. And I will develop an effective field theory uh, called membrane theory for this process. And I'll end with a summary and open questions. So let's start with the butterfly effect. So the butterfly effect is well known in classical mechanics. It uh, encodes the sensitivity to initial data. So here I have some coordinate and I perturb the initial uh, position. And then we have uh, exponential deviation between the trajectories. Um, it turns out that the appropriate generalization in uh, many body systems uh, is the following. Uh, we consider operators, uh, simple operators that, for example, in a lattice system, uh, mean that, on, that they only act on a couple of lattice sites, uh, or in, a, in an electron system, it only acts on a couple of particles. And uh, under Heisenberg time evolution, these evolve into complex operators acting on many lattice sites. Uh, and this uh, captures the intuition that one particle at late times uh, affects the entire system. So the addition of one particle uh, has an effect on the entire system. And so it was uh, first proposed in uh, work by Larkin and Ovchinikov, uh, I think 50 years ago, uh, that you have to do something like this. And this has been revived uh, recently by Shankar Stanford and Kitayev and many following them. So let's see an example. Uh, of uh, in the quantum many body system. So let's take a chaotic spin chain Hamiltonian. X, Y, Z are the Pauli matrices, and I is the lattice sign, site index. And these uh, numbers um, are tuned so that the system is uh, the most chaotic according to some measures and is easily simulable. Um, so let's try to get some intuition. Uh, by taking the first uh, lattice site and the Pauli Z operator on this lattice site and evolving it in time. Of course, uh, right out is, uh, is impossible because it involves uh, all the operate, a complete basis of operators in the system. But we can uh, make progress by going to infinitesimal times and then uh, using the K baker campbell hausdorff formula uh, we can expand in uh, infinitesimal time and we get nested commutators with the Hamiltonian. So let's see what these uh, terms are. So the first term is Z1. Uh, this commutator is boring, it just gives us Y1. The next one is more interesting. It gives a linear combination of three operators, two one-site operators and one two-site operators. The next term, which is not written here, is again somewhat boring, but you can see that now there's a shifting weight towards uh, more complicated operators. And then there is an explosion of terms. In the next term, uh, there are one site, two site, and even three site operators. As, as, as we go on, uh, this, this uh, linear combination of operators becomes uh, more and more complicated. Um, so this is what I mean, or this is an illustration of what we mean by uh, a simple operator, namely Z1, becoming a complex one. Uh, of course, uh, capturing um, uh, all this uh, in a, is very hard because we would have to take, uh, we have to keep track of all the operators. Uh, we want some diagnostic of this operator growth that is uh, uh, that we can understand. Um, and uh, the proposal of, of these authors was that uh, we can understand this um, using out of time ordered correlation functions. And apologies for, for this faint formula. Uh, I was going to write over it on the iPad, but I'm now unable to. Uh, but hopefully you can see it. So 
the out of time ordered correlation function is the following. I will denote it by C. It depends on the time and the spatial position. And it measures how complex the operator V at the origin becomes uh, as time evolves. So how do we measure that? We take a probe, probing operator W and take the commutator between V and W. Uh, so the idea is that this commutator is non-zero if the operator V uh, from the origin has already spread to the space-time point T and X. Um, to get rid of signs and phases, we square this. Um, because these are assumed to be Hermitian operators, the square is negative, so we put the minus sign. This is still an operator, so somewhat complicated, but we take an expectation value in a thermal state. And then we normalize by the norm of uh, V and W to have, to have a normalized quantity. And uh, why is this called out of time order correlator or out of time order commutator? Um, it's because if we expand out this commutator squared, then we will uh, encounter terms uh, that are uh, in time order. So in the, so something like WWVV, but also out of time order terms, WVWV under the trace. So Mark, I just have a question here. Yes. So I know that once we define, we uh, take a thermal state so is it always necessary to take a thermal state in this no it is not so you could take a vacuum expectation value but experience shows that um that uh, the there would be many operators whose vacuum expectation value is zero and so okay. you could have a situation that your operator has grown into a, a, a very complex one but those complex ones have zero vacuum expectation value and so this diagnostic if you took this in the vacuum uh, then wouldn't pick it up uh, okay. so here we are using the thermal state as just something that uh, uh, can uh, you know generically an operator will have a thermal expectation value whereas mm -hmm. it might not have a vacuum expectation value but in in the condensed matter context they actually just usually take a trace which yes, is not yes. a for, yeah. for, for quantum field theory because the trace of an operator is infinite so that's why we just we just want to get some generic thing it's okay. not necessary um i think it's not essential that we at least for this motivation um it's not essential that we put a thermal state in there sure Okay. Uh, oh, uh, I also have a couple of questions. Yes. So the first question is that, uh, uh, like you have defined, that uh, simple operators evolve into complex ones, right? So yes. uh, is this uh, is this sort of definition take, can be taken for any any kind of many body quantum system? For example, let's say we are talking about a black hole, and yes. or maybe it's the near horizon. We have a operator defined in the near horizon region. And uh, and can such a definition be used in that case as well? Yeah. So the the definition can be used. The question is, uh, I mean, yeah, this definition makes sense uh, for any system. And the question is, uh, what what answer you will get? And the expectation is that in a in a chaotic system, you get uh, some very nice universal. Uh, picture of how this function ct of x ct and x uh, looks uh, if you took an integrable theory or you took the expectation value in the vacuum you may get a different answer does that answer your question yeah and uh, and regarding this ct of x uh, like uh, there was just a discussion about thermal states could we actually also take like coherent states here Yes, you can take the expectation value in a pure state uh, or in a, or more especially in a coherent state. Uh, yeah. Yes, you can do that. I, in the literature, uh, it's the, under, the best understood example is the thermal state or in condensed matter, the trace. Um, 
and uh, there have been some attempts in understanding it in energy eigenstates, uh, but in, in systems which obey the, the eigenstate thermization hypothesis. So it's basically the, those, those behave just like the, as if they, they were thermal. So the result there is that in energy eigenstates, uh, this gives the same answer as if you were in a thermal state. Thank you. But that, those are just examples, and there's no well-developed theory for what you will get. It's just some expectation. All right. Okay, so let me show you how this function looks on a contour plot. So uh, we have uh, uh, so uh, here I plot for you space-time. Uh, so this is the time direction and this is the space and uh, the observation in, in many examples uh, is that uh, this C goes to its maximal possible value inside the cone-like region um, which uh, is offset from the origin by the scrambling time and it has a slope which defines the butterfly velocity. And outside this region, uh, C is very small and it has a very sharp profile. Okay. Um, now, if our system uh, is a relativistic quantum field theory, then we have an exact microscopic light cone, uh, this guy here. And uh, this butterfly cone lies uh, st strictly within it and it's narrower. So. You can see that this is the speed of light and the butterfly speed is smaller than the speed of light. Um, so if we go to a hydrodynamic like regime, uh, namely we go to times that are a lot greater than beta, the inverse temperature, but a lot smaller than the scrambling time. So we are lurking somewhere around here. Then in large end systems, uh, this OTOC grows exponentially. It starts out as small, suppressed by as one over n squared, but then it grows exponentially. And so around times of, of order log n, it becomes order one. So we learn that the scrambling time is of order log n. And uh, Madison Schenker Stanford famously proved uh, that uh, in these systems, uh, the Yapunov exponent uh, is bounded from a, so lambda L is the Yapunov exponent. It's the direct analog uh, of the Yapunov exponent uh, from classical mechanics. Um, and uh, this guy uh, is bounded from above universally by two pi over beta. Okay. Now, um, if we are interested in uh, not just the, the time evolution of uh, the OTOC, but also the spatial structure, and then we can do the following thing as suggested by these authors. Um, it's easier to analyze functions of one variables than, than two. So we simply uh, take a, a, a array of uh, characterized by the velocity v. So this guy, the blue line uh, on this figure, uh, and ask how fast does the uh, the OTOC grow uh, along this direction. Of course, if we know uh, its behavior along every ray, then we will know it uh, at every uh, point. Uh, but this is, this is an educational exercise to, to go along rays. And so, it, so we can define a velocity dependent Yapunov exponent this way. We will see that uh, actually the OTOC grows exponentially along every ray um, inside the butterfly cone. And uh, with uh, Sharoshi, we proved uh, or, or we refined the this scale, MSS chaos bound uh, for this to make it a velocity dependent bound. And so it's the 2 pi over beta, and then there's a linear factor in uh, the velocity. So here's the bound. Uh, it's this dashed orange line. It goes to zero at the butterfly uh, velocity, which is um, in agreement with this cartoon, uh, because if we draw a line which is uh, 
uh, closer to the to the true light cone, uh, then the butterfly velocity in that region, the OTOC stays small, and correspondingly, we don't get exponential growth. The remarkable thing about this bound uh, is that uh, the generic velocity dependence of this uh, velocity dependent Lyapunov exponent lambda v is such uh, that even if uh, the system is not maximally chaotic, uh, at v equals zero, that's the original setup. Uh, as we go to, towards the edge of the butterfly cone, generically, um, there will be a point where uh, we touch the, the bound and from then on we saturate. Um, so, so I think that's a remarkable result. Uh, so you can say words like, even if the system is not maximally chaotic in this sense, uh, if, as we go towards the edge of the butterfly cone, it might, it, that enhances chaos and the system might become maximally chaotic in that sense. So let me show you a concrete example, uh, which is uh, the so-called uh, large Q SYK chain. You don't necessarily need to know what that is. It's just some strongly interacting spin chain with uh, many on-site degrees of freedom. And in upcoming work uh, with Choi and Sharoshi, um, we show the following thing, following these uh, early uh, important papers, that the growing piece of the OTOC uh, is given by uh, the following integral. There's an integral of a momentum, and uh, there's uh, an exponential growth. Uh, there's also a Fourier mode in X, and then a denominator with the same lambda p function. And then this, in this system, we can analytically compute um, this lambda of p, uh, which uh, takes this form. So there's a prefactor g, which is the coupling constant. Uh, it takes values between 0 and 1. Uh, for 0, it's a free theory. For 1, it's uh, the maximally chaotic point. Uh, but we have a result uh, for any coupling. Uh, this G is related to the more conventional SYK coupling through this relation. So beta J is the conventional SYK coupling. Uh, the strongly coupled phase uh, is encountered when we take beta J uh, to infinity, and that corresponds to G going to 1 and the denominator uh, vanishing. Okay, so we have an analytic expression for the OTOC uh, as a form, as an integral form and let's read off the uh, lambda of b from here. Uh, so if we go to this hydrodynamic like regime uh, for large times, uh, then we can use a saddle point approximation of this integral and uh, that's illustrated in these figures. So for small v, the saddle point um, is on the imaginary axis um, and the the original integration contour is on the real axis. We have to deform the contour to go through the saddle point, and we pick up the contribution of the saddle point, and that uh, short calculation shows that lambda of v uh, will be just the Legendre transform of lambda of p. So we take the Legendre transform of, of uh, lambda p, and you get uh, this curve uh, lambda v that I plotted here. Okay. As we increase v, it may happen that the saddle crosses this pole. This pole is coming from this denominator. Uh, and then if we want to deform the contour to go through the saddle, we will also pick up the contribution of the pole. And then we have to add up the, these contributions, and it, all, it turns out that the pole always dominates in this case. The pole is coming from uh, the presence of the stress tensor. Um, and uh, and in, in this case, uh, we will see that uh, the bound, this refined chaos bound is saturated by the stress tensor contribution. So here I'm plotting you uh, the, uh, what we get for two values of the coupling constant. For the coupling constant close to one, uh, we first get this Legendre transform piece, but then V star is very low. And uh, from then on, uh, lambda of v is, is determined by the stress tensor contribution and it saturates the bound. As we go to small coupling, uh, 
this uh, V star uh, goes to the right and uh, leaves the, the butterfly cone. And so for small coupling, uh, we get that uh, we are always in, in, this, uh, in this situation. And uh, lambda of V is the Legendre transform of lambda of V for all uh, values of V inside the butterfly cone. And in this case, uh, the stress tensor never dominates chaos. And correspondingly, the butterfly velocity is not given by the stress tensor contribution of, to the butterfly velocity. Any questions about this analysis? Any question, please ask. Nitin, you have any question? Uh, no, it's okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that... No, 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 it's, it's very good. Like, I prefer to ask questions. Guys, please ask questions if you have... Okay. So this may have been uh, somewhat technical. Uh, the the take-home point is that uh, it may happen that the refined chaos bound uh, is uh, is saturated uh, above some critical velocity, and uh, I explained the mechanism uh, that leads to this in in a concrete model. Um, so similar things happen in. Uh, conformal field theories on hyperbolic space. So that's a nice setup uh, in which you can use vacuum results to get uh, thermal correlators in, in, in a quantum system. The, the trick is that uh, HD minus one cross S1 uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, well, HD minus one times R uh, is uh, conformally equivalent to flat space, so you can use vacuum correlators uh, to get um, uh, yeah, get, get thermal uh, answers. Uh, so we have uh, so using conformal Regi theory uh, developed in the last decade. Decade, uh, we can get that the growing piece of the uh, OTOC is given by a very similar integral to what we encountered in the SYK model. And the uh, role of lambda of P is played uh, by a function called J of nu. Nu is a proxy for scaling dimension. And so this function J of nu uh, is uh, the so-called leading gray trajectory um, of, of the operators, so you, so operators in conformal field theory arrange themselves on Regi trajectories. Uh, and they are at fractional, uh, so they are at, um, sorry, they come uh, at random dimensions, but they all have e integer spins. And uh, if you plot them, then they lie on a trajectory and it turns out that trajectory is an analytic function. So J is the spin and U is a proxy for the scaling dimension. And we get a formula like this. And uh, in particular, this, this uh, Regi trajectory is known in planar N equals four super young Mills theory from integrability. There are very nice uh, plots that you can make of this. And there are explicit expressions, um, both for V star as a function of the top coupling and the butterfly velocity the contribution of the stress tensor to the butterfly velocity. And uh, from this, these results, we can read off that for lambda greater than 37.7, lambda is the top coupling, uh, we, have, we are in this kind of situation, uh, whereas below it, we are in this kind of situation. And note that uh, we only get maximal chaos in the uh, infinite top coupling limit, uh, but this, in this refined sense, uh, we can get maximal chaos if we go uh, towards the edge of the butterfly cone if we are above 37 in the top. Okay, so to end this part of the talk, uh, uh, I list some open questions. So we were analyzing some hydrodynamic-like limit of the OTOC. Uh, but it would be nice not to, to just have ex expressions or answers, but the whole effective field theory framework uh, for, for why the answers simplify and uh, 
in, in this limit. Uh, and there's a very nice uh, effective field theory for maximal chaos uh, by Blake, Lee, and Liu, uh, but it's unclear at the moment how to generalize it away from maximal chaos. Uh, in the strongly coupled SYK model, we know that such an effective field theory is the Schwarzian uh, action of reparametrizations. And so if we had uh, such a framework, it would be very interesting to understand how the Schwarzian fits into this. And uh, we are currently uh, with these uh, collaborators uh, working on trying to uh, use our knowledge about uh, large QSYK to try to come up with, with such an effective th th theory. As you uh, saw... Mark? Yes. So can you comment on this asymmetric reparameterization a little bit more? Yes, yes, I can. So, so it turns out, so I showed you how to get the lambda v in the large qsyk chain or i just showed you the answer i didn't show you how to get it so uh the end of last year both striker and simultaneously us uh, obtained the explicit four point function in closed form for just one large qsyk dot at all temperatures or at all coupling strength and um, so there's some closed form formula and uh, we are discovering that it seems to come from reparametrizations of, uh, of the saddle point uh, in, in SYK, in large QSYK, but in a, in a way that you are, so the saddle point is a Green's function, depends on two times, and you have to uh, reparametrize these two times uh, differently. And so that's what I mean by asymmetric reparametrizations. In the Schwarzian limit, you, the way you get this effective theory is that you reparametrize the saddle point Green's function uh, with this, so both arguments with the same reparametrization. And then you use the Schwarzian action or the Schwarzian propagator uh, to uh, compute the four point function. Here, you need to do something more complicated and we don't yet understand the full story, but that's, uh, that's the hint that we are seeing. Uh, I just want to ask one thing more. Yeah. So like, apart from SYK, probably you heard about something called tensor models. Yes. Uh, so do you have any intuition on that as well? Well, my way? understanding is, my understanding is that the tensor models uh, in when when we are talking about quant yeah for the tensor models uh, at large n uh, you get the same answers as you get true true in true. SYK yeah yes so so in in that regard we don't win anything from analyzing tensor models at leading order at sub leading orders uh, there's a more intricate story Mm -hmm. Yes, but but for the purposes of of this talk, it doesn't provide any any new additional answers. information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and note that I was uh, analyzing relatively early times. It's a very interesting question: what happens near the scrambling time? I mean, there's a very qualitative picture of what should happen, uh, but to understand uh, more quantitatively. Uh, we don't really have good high energy tools to do that. Um, but the random circuit models in condensed matter and quantum information uh, seem to be a, a good analytic tool to analytic and numerical tool uh, to, uh, to ask those questions. And so, get but by answers. random circuit models, you want to comment on the tensor networks? Y yes, they can be thought about uh, thought of as tensor networks. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so this concludes this part of the talk. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will go on. Guys, please ask question. I can see a lot of people right now. Okay. So. Abhinash, do you, don't, don't you have any question? No, I didn't want to force anybody to ask. No, no, it's not forcing because they are also working on similar 
kind of stuffs. That's why I'm asking. Okay, you proceed. Yeah, so, uh, so now we come to post skipping and uh, I'll try to satisfy your curiosity about it. So what is post skipping? The motivation is that uh, while this OTOC is a very well motivated quantity from operator growth, it's still an incredibly complicated object to analyze. Uh, one may wonder if we can read out uh, or tease out uh, the data of chaos from some simpler observable. Um, and uh, these authors have realized uh, that there's a subtle signature of chaos in two point functions at the special point um, omega and p so these are momentum space variables uh, equaling i times lambda l one and the, the momentum value is i lambda l divided by the butterfly velocity so why okay. is your but yeah okay let, let me explain what happens there yeah sorry. Uh, so uh, let's take the energy density energy density retarded two-point function it has a family of poles which start their lives as hydrodynamic poles. Um, if we are in a system that conserves momentum, then this would be a sound mode, linear dis with the linear dispersion relation. Uh, this is the speed of sound. And then as we go to higher momentum, uh, then uh, there's some non-trivial trajectory of this uh, family of poles on, on the complex plane. Uh, if the system doesn't conserve momentum, then this uh, family of poles uh, start its life as a diffusion pole uh, at pure imaginary value at the lower half plane. Now, the statement of pole skipping is twofold. Firstly, this line of poles passes through this point uh, that I mentioned, and at this point, the residue of the pole vanishes. Um, so note that this is some special location. It's outside the hydrodynamic regime since um, the, the momentum is of order the temperature, whereas in the hydrodynamic re regime you go to a lot, slower, lot lower values of the momentum. And it's at also at unphysical momentum uh, because it's at imaginary momentum. Uh, but of course things are defined through analytic continuation. So this uh, test axiomatic theory so far, and in ADS-CFT, in a strongly coupled SYK chain, and in stress tensor dominated CFTs on hyperbolic space. And it's, uh, this phenomenon is also explained by the EFT for maximal chaos of blakely Liu. Um, and we asked the question uh, in, uh, in an upcoming paper, what happens away from maximal chaos. So we are already without working much, uh, we can try to make an intelligent proposal or an educated guess. So using uh, these results about CFTs in hyperbolic space, uh, we know that the, this two point function is uh, universal and namely is the same uh, up to the prefactor of central charge for all conformal field theories. But not all conformal field theories are chaotic. For example, the free scalar is not. Um, and so it seems uh, unlikely, I mean, to get a, a correct proposal, it cannot be that the Yapunov exponent shows up here. Um, also, we saw that the true butterfly velocity is uh, so at weak coupling is smaller than the but than the stress that what the stress tensor contribution alone would uh, give you. And so our proposal is that the pause skipping pause skipping really happens uh, at this point. So the Yapunov exponent uh, is replaced by two pi over beta. And uh, the butterfly velocity in the original proposal is replaced by the stress tensor contribution to the butterfly velocity. 
So note that this uh, produces agreement with the maximal chaotic cases because in that case, uh, this is the Yapunov exponent and the VBT ag agrees with VB. And the real um, technical work went into determining this uh, energy density, energy density uh, retarded two point function in again the large QSYK chain. Uh, which we managed to do in closed form. Uh, and if we plot uh, the absolute value of it for imaginary momentum and imaginary frequency, then we get the following plot. The uh, bright lines or like regions are where the function is big and the blue ones are where the function is small. So you can see that uh, in this quadrant, there's a line of poles. So this is, it starts its life as a diffusion pole uh, and it does something like this, but there's also a line of zeros close to it. And at this point, they intersect. And so this is where the residue vanishes. If we zoom in, then we see uh, a line which is a bit steeper and the line which is a, a less steep intersecting at a point. And this is exactly at this point, which we can analytically uh, confirm. So the, so the nice uh, byproduct of, of this investigation is that we have an explicit thermal green fu greens function in, a, in, a, in an interacting uh, uh, chain. Um, and the explicit formula is uh, really simple. Um, it's given by uh, the logarithmic derivative of a function evaluated at some value of x. And this function is a, is a linear combination of two hypergeometric functions. Um, I, I have it on my backup slides if anybody is uh, interested. Um, and this is a precious result in, in thermal physics. Uh, to, to my knowledge, this is the, uh, apart from uh, CFTs, which, are uni which give a universal answer and uh, don't really reveal uh, the change of physics as you go from strong to weak coupling. This is the only closed form expression for a thermal two-point function. So Mark, I just have one question. Mm -hmm. So like I, I can understand what you are saying, but like uh, which intuition uh, allows you to write down this proposal that you say that, okay, this uh, velocity is basically coming from the contribution of the stress, uh, stress tensor. So I mean, are able to. So, yeah, yeah. So, so it's because the, we are talking about an energy density, energy density correlation function. Exactly. Um, so, that's related to the stress tensor. So, that's where the idea of the stress tensor contribution comes from. Mm -hmm. um, so why, why didn't we insert just some number instead of this theory dependent quantity? Yeah. The reason yes. is that these, these, these maximally chaotic examples, um, I mean, I have some experience with them and while they all have maximal Yaponov exponent, their butterfly velocities are very dependent on the theory. So it was very clear to, to us that uh, that there is some non even if the Yapunov exponent doesn't show up here uh, in the away from maximal chaos, uh, it's a very non-trivial thing that the butterfly velocity uh, shows up in the pause skipping phenomenon. But it cannot be the true. I mean, then we were guessing that it wouldn't be the the true butterfly velocity because it depends on all this rigid trajectory stuff. Uh, but it could be uh, the butterfly velocity contribution from the stress tensor. And then it plays nicely with, the, with what we learned in the previous section, that for many theories uh, that are at intermediate coupling, not very weak, but intermediate or strong, the, near the edge of the butterfly cone, the stress tensor dominates chaos. Uh, and so it it's plausible that the stress tensor contribution to the butterfly velocity shows up there. And then uh, our evidence for this new proposal is coming from this explicit formula where we can tune a coupling. There's actually another coupling that I didn't talk about. And for all of all these values, we get that this point 
uh, this fork skipping point is indeed at this point. But we don't have a proof. So what is the uh, meaning of N, the pool? This N, and N the... is the Matsubara frequency. Oh, you can okay. see that, so N is equal to a minus I omega plus an epsilon where epsilon is an infinite. This is just a, a prescription for analytic continuation. Yes, 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 I can understand. Yes, thank okay. you for your explanation. So uh, let me summarize what we talked about so far. So I talked about the spatial structure of OTOCs and how it's probed by this function lambda v, the velocity dependent Yapunov exponent. And these are the typical uh, plots that we would get. This is a strong coupling. This is a weak coupling. Uh, we analyzed some explicit examples. Uh, and uh, we saw that the refined chaos bound is saturated when the stress tensor dominates chaos. And uh, the outstanding question is whether there's an EFT and whether we can derive. Uh, so the post skip, the new proposal for the post skipping point is this. Uh, it captures the stress tensor contribution to chaos. Uh, and we know that uh, if we are above this V star on this plot, uh, so for V between V star and VB, chaos is controlled by the stress tensor. Um, so in that sense, uh, this is really a sensitive signature, signature of chaos. But the cautionary remark is uh, that the contribution of the stress tensor to chaos can be decreased or even canceled completely in the case of, for example, a free scalar CFT. Uh, so just by knowing that your uh, energy density two-point function exhibits or skipping, you don't necessarily learn that your theory is chaotic. So this uh, demystifies uh, the post skipping phenomenon uh, in the sense that the energy density, energy density two point function uh, and uh, this uh, stress tensor contribution to the butterfly velocity, both are properties of the stress tensor. It's not so mysterious that the two could be related. Um, but uh, it was, but the stress tensor alone does not determine the value of the Yapunov exponent. And so uh, in the original proposal, the appearance of the Yapunov exponent was somewhat mysterious. In this proposal, it's no more uh, there. And uh, one question is uh, how to explicitly see that this pause skipping point somehow translates to the contribution of the stress tensor um, <clears throat> to chaos, um, and how does it make uh, the the butterfly, sorry, uh, lambda v vanish at the butterfly velocity at exactly this point? Uh, in the framework of of this maximal chaos AFT of Blake Liu, there is an answer, uh, and then there are other hints. But for me, that's still a question, and probably would only only be qual. Uh, clarified once we understand what the EFT of uh, of submaximal chaos is that would reproduce uh, uh, this out of time order correlator. Okay. So with that, uh, I can now move on to my third topic, um, which is thermalization in uh, out of equilibrium setups, uh, which we will probe using entanglement entropy. So I will give a very brief introduction to quantum thermalization. Uh, please ask questions if, if something is not clear. I will be very intuitive here. Um, so it is well known that to define thermalization, we need some coarse graining prescription. Um, in a gas, in classical stat mag, uh, we coarse grain over multiparticle correlation. We throw them out, and this is the way uh, many microstates can give rise to the same macrostate. In many body systems or quantum field theories, uh, the, course, the most uh, convenient cost graining is to take, uh, so this is a sketch of the system. It's, uh, it's in isolation that's represented by these orange walls. Uh, and this is a time slice through the system. 
uh, and uh, we take a geometric subsystem A and uh, the rest of the system A bar and we regard A bar as if it was the environment or the heat bath that our subsystem is sitting in. But here the division is only imaginary. Um, and so once we have that, and our global state is psi, uh, then we can perform the partial trace operation of, uh, over um, A bar, uh, the complement of A, and get the reduced density matrix that describes the complete information we need uh, to predict the outcomes of any experiment that we, we perform in A. So this is the definition of reduced density matrix and we consider it to have some coarse grain, but because we know that to study thermalization, we need some coarse grain. And uh, in analogy with the second law of thermodynamics, we expect that the entanglement entropy, which is just a von Neumann entropy of this reduced density matrix and is associated to the region A, will increase with time. I mean, this is just some very rough intuition. And um, so let's see a little bit more detail. So we will be uh, dealing with entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. So good, uh, so two salient features of entanglement entropy that we will need is that in ground states of local Hamiltonians, the entropy scales with the area of the boundary of our subregion. is the famous area law. Uh, so here we have the area and we, it's made dimensionless by the appropriate power uh, of some uh, intrinsic scale to the system, for example, the lattice constant or cutoff in quantum field theory. And the good cartoon to memorize what's going on uh, is the following. Uh, that, um, so correlations are assumed to be short length in the vacuum, in the ground state. And that's illustrated by uh, these light blue uh, arrows. And uh, I colored purple the degrees of freedom who contribute to the entanglement entropy. So the ones that are entangled but are both inside do not, and both the ones that are outside do not. Only the ones where one member of the pair is inside and one pair is outside uh, contributes. And so we get an area worth of, uh, of entanglement entropy from this picture. So that's a mnemonic for the area law. But ground states of local Hamiltonians are special. A generic state in the Hilbert space instead shows volume loss scaling, the volume of the subregion. So here's a, here's a cartoon. The typical degrees of freedom inside is entangled with many of its friends, both inside and outside. And every, in every point in, inside this uh, subregion, uh, we, we get the same contribution. So adding them up gives us a volume law. And by law, I mean that as we scale up these regions, the, the scaling of entanglement entropy is area versus volume. So, so far, uh, these are just the static setups. Um, the purest way to put dynamics into uh, this system uh, is to is the uh, that of a, is the quantum quench protocol. So we start with the ground state of a local Hamiltonian, so this cartoon, and then we abruptly change the Hamiltonian and let the system evolve. If the system thermalizes, that at long times we expect that we will arrive at the typical state, um, and so we will end up with this cartoon. If the Hamiltonian is translation invariant then there's actually no transport of conserved quantities going on in this process. So if we just studied hydrodynamics, we would say that nothing happened. But if we look at the level of the wave function, that entanglement entropy, then we see that uh, there's lots of dynamics. So I already discussed that thermalization cannot mean that the total state of the system becomes uh, the thermal state that's inconsistent with unitarity. Instead, we need coarse graining. Uh, and by, we define thermalization to mean that the reduced density matrix of the subregion goes to uh, the equilibrium density matrix at late times, which we obtain 
by tracing over the environment uh, of the canonical density matrix. Uh, again, uh, following uh, uh, a complicated operator, uh, is unfeasible, just like studying the growth of uh, local operators under Heisenberg time evolution. We need a diagnostic. And entanglement entropy uh, is such a diagnostic. So we will study as it goes from low values uh, from this area law setup um, to, uh, to volume law, um, where the there the constant of proportionality is the thermal entropy density at the appropriate temperature. And uh, this is a universal probe well defined for all quantum systems. And by studying it, we hope to capture the essence of thermalization. Okay, so uh, one overarching theme of this talk was that we want to go to some simplifying hydrodynamic limit. How can we achieve that here? So in this uh, cartoon, uh, I represent the quench by this uh, purple plane. And then um, I go to some time t and consider my time slice there. This is my subregion of interest with linear size r. I assume that, OK, so I keep the ratio of t and r fixed. But I take both of them large, a lot larger than the relevant scale, which is the local uh, thermalization time scale, which in strongly coupled systems is proportional to beta. In weakly coupled systems, it's more like proportional to beta over, the, over, over G, where the coupling is small. So this can be a large scale. So I want to go to a lot bigger distances and times than that. Uh, and study the dynamics there. This is like this is this limit is inspired by hydrodynamics. And the entanglement entropy dynamics is expected to simplify in that uh, in this in this limit. Uh, and we want to develop an effective description for the leading extensive piece of it. Uh, by extensive, I mean that I since we are at relatively late times, it's uh, reasonable to extract the thermal entropy density. Then we have uh, an, an extensive scaling with uh, the linear size of the region times a scaling function that depends only on the ratio of the uh, dar. And then there are subleading corrections. So a qualitative picture. Uh, we have a qualitative picture of what's going to happen from the study of 2D CFTs and also from ADS CFT. So at early times, there's some transient behavior. There's a parametrically long linear growth of the entropy, which then smoothly caps off, and at some finite time, which is of order the linear size of the region, and we saturate to the thermal value. Um, the linear growth uh, is universal in the sense that it only depends on the shape of the region through the area of its boundary. Uh, we already argued that it's natural to extract the and thermal entropy density, and then the slope is controlled by a quantity that is defined uh, here, which is the um, VE, the entanglement velocity. Okay, so this is a qualitative picture that we learned from these studies and also from uh, spin chain numerics. Um, but to, uh, we want to be more quantitative. So, uh, Mark, just yes. uh, last picture. So, uh, when this starts saturating, uh, uh, like, uh, like, what's the uh, like uh, intuition gives you the uh, time scale, exact time scale? The well, if it's linear growth uh, and you want to saturate to volume, uh, so. So look, so here the area goes as r to the d minus two. Uh, so r to the d minus two times time. Uh, once you want to get r to the d minus one, that's the volume. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It's also the light crossing time. And it's also the time it takes for correlation functions at large separation to saturate. So it's not a surprising thing that it's linear. Yeah. Uh, but we want to understand it not just its scaling but its exact value so that's exactly, exactly yes 
So, so let me show you uh, two case studies. Any uh, question? Some, some, yeah. somebody is asking. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, can you please go back to the previous slide? Yes. So, uh, in the bottom right diagram, uh, yes. like this is for 2D CFT, right? It's in both ADS. for 2D CFT and higher dimensional CFT. Okay. So, it's you always like, get linear growth uh, independent of the dimension. And what about that saturation? What about that saturation? So, in 2D CFT, the saturation is uh, somewhat, is like a, it goes with a kink. So, you have exact linear growth. And then uh, you just have abrupt saturation, whereas uh, in higher dimensions it's like smoothed out, and uh, yeah, you can determine the. Okay, there are some situations where you can determine uh, this uh, the exact power law as uh, the way it saturates, but oftentimes it curves, but it doesn't curve completely, and there's still some uh, kink in the slope. Okay, so uh, uh, like. Uh... Uh, this kind of uh, uh, entropy calculation is it uh, uh, has it been done for like uh, other cases as well like besides uh, 2d and things like that like well uh, I, I will tell you where it has been done uh, yeah uh, okay, thank you. That, that will be the rest of the talk it hasn't been done in too many uh, systems uh, mm -hmm. of course, because it's ex extremely hard to compute entanglement entropy, but it has been done in some systems and, and that's what we will use to build an effective theory. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. So, uh, here I'm showing you one example where uh, we have done the calculation. Um, so, the data points uh, are uh, for uh, free scalar theory and the subregion is a disk. So we do a quench in free scalar theory and we numerically compute the entanglement entropy and we get these data points. And there's a solid line. It's uh, very faint, but hopefully you can see it on your screen. And that's the prediction of uh, the so-called quasi-particle theory uh, first proposed in uh, 2D by Cardi Calabrese and generalized by us uh, to higher D. And this is a zero parameter uh, prediction. And you can see that it exactly goes through the data points. Uh, there are some small deviations, but those are finite size effects. So as we go to the strict hydrodynamic limit, uh, this plot is an evidence uh, for the effective theory, namely the quasi-particle theory, uh, describing the real time evolution of entanglement entropy that was computed from, you know, studying the wave function numeric. This is for a very large uh, uh, system size. Uh, the radius of the disk is three, 300 in lattice units. That's why you don't see much deviation. Uh, one can also do uh, computations in holography numerically. Those are the data points. Uh, and they have been rescaled uh, to, to roughly collapse onto the same curve. The ones that deviate more from the red curve uh, are for small system si subsystem sizes, and the ones that are almost lying on the red curve are for large subsystem sizes. And the, the red solid line is the prediction of the membrane theory. This is the effective theory uh, for, for this uh, system. And you can see that the, the numerical data uh, coincide with the analytic prediction. And the deviations are controlled by one over R. So one conclusion that we draw from these two pictures that growth of entanglement entropy alone does not detect chaos because it, this is happening in free field theory. So this is a very analogous situation uh, to what we saw in Paul Skip. Um, but for chaotic systems, uh, we can build a universal affective theory that I will call membrane theory and uh, it gives uh, detailed and accurate predictions and uh, the dynamic the detailed dynamics of entanglement entropy in chaotic systems and integrable theories are different i won't have time to talk about the quasi particle theory um, i will focus in the rest of the talk on the membrane theory hey, you have time you just don't well <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, I have time, but uh, I I have backup slides. But I thought that if I talk about too many things, then it distracts yeah, no, the no, message. Like, if you so, see, yeah, like so if, my once yeah. Finish, I, once you finish, if somebody have uh, yeah like, uh, want to exactly. ask, then you yes, that that's exactly the plan. Yeah. Um, but but I want to stay on message that we are analyzing chaotic dynamics here, so that's why I didn't want to okay, okay, no delve problem. into integrable theories. But I'm happy to discuss offline. Um, now I will try to illustrate how to derive uh, this affective theory, and then we will explore it a little bit. So let me remind you that in ADS CFT. Uh, entanglement entropy is computed by uh, an extremal surface area, uh, probing uh, in this setup the out of equilibrium state. So what is the out of equilibrium? What's the gravitational uh, representation of the out of equilibrium state? Uh, it's a space time uh, of a collapsing black hole. So this is the ADS boundary on this Penrose diagram. Um, this is the time uh, t equals zero where I perform the quench. Uh, I model the quench uh, for illustration purposes. We can talk about other quenches as well uh, by uh, an infalling uh, null dust shell uh, that collapses towards the middle uh, of ADS. This is the Poincare horizon. Um, and so I'm, I'm using that kind of representation. Uh, so it collapses towards the middle of ADS and then it forms a black hole. Uh, the dashed line is the black hole horizon and the red line is the singularity. And we are probing the space time with extremal surfaces, computing their areas, and that gives us the entanglement entry. Um, so the important step uh, towards deriving an effective field theory is to implement this hydrodynamic limit that we talked about. T over R fixed, both are large, uh, and we want to only capture the leading contribution. So here I also put uh, a 3D version of the Penrose diagram that probably is more educational than the 2D version, uh, at least to visualize what the extremal surface is doing. So it's anchored on the boundary, in this case, on an interval of this width. And then it goes towards the bulk. It crosses the black hole horizon represented by this gray plane. It goes behind the horizon. That's perhaps best uh, seen uh, on, on this picture where we look at the, this Penrose diagram from, uh, from, from this angle. And we take a project. So it's kind of horizon. And then it, in the past, it crosses the shell, uh, the infalling dust shell that formed the black hole. And then it caps off in this region of the geometry, which, uh, which is just pure ADS. So that's what typical extremal surfaces are doing. And we want to understand them uh, in this limit, in this hydro limit. Um, it turns out from a detailed analysis that uh, if we are only interested in the leading part, then we only have to analyze surfaces in this green sliver of the space time. So behind the horizon and uh, after uh, the, the shell has fallen in. Um, and uh, uh, the way we do that is that we push uh, or project that part of the extremal surface to the boundary along constant infalling null lines. Uh, so you can see it in this 3D plot or, or here. So these are the infalling null lines. Um, and we push every point uh, of this extremal surface uh, to the boundary and we get a projection like this. So this projection now lives in the boundary Minkowski space. Okay. So this is the picture we get in the boundary Minkowski space. We get the co-dimension one surface. So in this case, it's a two-dimensional space-time and, and the word line of a particle. The projection of this infalling matter shell becomes this line, this orange line. And the time slice on which we are studying the entanglement entropy becomes this black line. 
use the interval. And this uh, projection is anchored uh, on the endpoints of the interval. And it also ends on this uh, orange uh, line. We threw away this part of the extremal surface that lies behind the matter shell because it doesn't contribute to the leading piece of the area. Now, you can always do this projection uh, in any situation, of course. Uh, but here, the remarkable simplification is that this projection uh, uh, obeys. Uh, uh, so, sorry, the dynamics of the projection is governed by a, uh, a local action that is written here. Um, and once we solve this problem, then we can, if we want, reconstruct the full extremal surface in the curved geometry. But for now, we will just focus on, on this local action. So one piece of intuition is that, or one, one set of words that goes with this procedure is that we basically integrated out uh, the bulk radial direction. Since things were happening in a, in a narrow sliver, in this space, in this space time behind the horizon, uh, it uh, it turns out that we can integrate out this extra direction and reduce the problem to one lower dimension. Okay, so in in this example, we are studying an action for a for a word line of a particle. Uh, so it's an in integral over time, uh, and this uh, word line has a velocity at every point. And we have a Lagrangian that depends only on that velocity. This is epsilon of v. Um, for a classical mechanics problem, we also need boundary conditions. The boundary conditions is that the word line has to end on the, uh, on the interval. And uh, down here on the orange line, it has to end perpendicularly. That corresponds to zero velocity there um, or Neumann boundary conditions. And so we are instructed to minimize this action. Um, and uh, the on shell value of this action will give us the entropy as a function of time. OK, so why is this called membrane theory? Um, sorry, yes, yeah, so it's here. So in higher dimensions, uh, we really get the membrane. So for example, here, the subregion of interest is an ellipse. And uh, with Wilke van der Schie, we determine numerically how this surface, how the projection uh, looks in this setup. Uh, so we get uh, really a membrane, like a soap bubble stretching between these two uh, end slabs of Minkowski space. Uh, and and this, the dynamics of this membrane is governed by a local action. So this part would be just the, the area of function of the brains. The, there are some coordinates on the membrane, and this is the induced metric. But things are a bit more complicated. Uh, there's a non-trivial Lagrangian that depends on the velocity at, the, at each point of, of the membrane. What do I mean by a velocity of a membrane? It's the appropriate generalization of this velocity for the word line. So we take uh, these green arrows, uh, which are local unit normals, and then we dot them into uh, the time-like unit vector. So that gives us something, some number. Uh, and then uh, we take this combination and that gives us V. In the case of a word line, this reproduces the velocity. Um, uh, another piece of useful intuition is that if we slice this membrane uh, with different time slices, we get a figure like this. And this velocity V is nothing as just the local velocity of this wavefront, this propagating wavefront as it propagates from, from the uh, outside uh, ellipse uh, toward inverts. Okay, so I forgot to say one thing, that where do we get this function epsilon of V? It's a repackaging of the geometry. Um, and since it's coming from the or the equilibrium part of the space-time, it's manifestly independent on, on the actual details of the quench. So it only depends on conserved quantities, and this squares well with our intuition that in chaotic systems, uh, apart from the values of conserved densities, uh, the system should forget uh, about the initial conditions very quickly. And we are at late times, so 
there the system had enough times to time to forget about okay and finally i want to illustrate how this function epsilon of v looks um, so it's a function like this one can prove from the null energy condition in the bulk that it's monotonic and convex uh, its intercept with the y-axis is uh, this VE that determines the linear growth of entropy. And our old friend, the butterfly velocity, shows up as a special point along this, uh, along this uh, function. Uh, it's the point where it touches the 45 degree line. This just comes out as a surprise from, uh, from if you explicitly evaluate this function epsilon of V and you also compute the butterfly velocity in the same system um, but there can be and but there are some consistency arguments in the literature that argue for this that that this had to be the case but we, we see a non-trivial interplay between entanglement dynamics and and operator dynamics through the appearance of the same quantity that controls both okay so this concludes the presentation of the membrane theory. Is there any question about what, how you should, uh, what's the problem we're supposed to solve and, and anything else? Okay, so the membrane theory is a simplified theory for determining the entanglement dynamics. It reduces the holographic problem, which is a surface extremization problem in D plus one dimensions to a membrane minimization problem in boundary Minkowski space-time. It's a simpler problem. It extracts the leading piece of the entropy by, if you solve the membrane minimization problem with the appropriate boundary conditions and take the on shell value of this action, that gives you the entropy at the given time. Okay, so let's get some experience with this membrane theory. Uh, for for simpler ge simple geometries so for a strip um cylinder and sphere regions we can solve the problem analytically let's first take the strip by symmetry it's easy to argue that the membrane will be just straight going down and that gives us exact linear growth until some saturation time de determined by the width of the cylinder uh, the strip uh, divided by ve so this is the entropy as a function of time that we get. For a sphere, we get more interesting uh, membrane dynamics. So this is still analytically solvable. So at early times, we have a straight membrane, and I'm suppressing angular directions. Then at intermediate times, the membrane starts to bend in, and at saturation, it becomes a cone of slope VB, the bottom velocity. So here's the entropy as a function of time, and I superpose these characteristic membrane shapes on it. And the saturation time in this geometry is R over VB. Again, the special role of VB uh, is clear. And then with Wilke, uh, we have also solved uh, the problem for arbitrary shapes. So here's uh, this, this shape in, in four dimensions. Uh, here's a characteristic membrane, here are the cross sections, and uh, the black curve is the entropy as a function of time, and there's also a red curve which comes uh, from a simple bound that we uh, derived uh, from the general, general rules of quantum mechanics and the insight into chaos with Douglas Stanford. And you can see that the bound is rather tight, even for arbitrary shapes. Um, from this bound, uh, one thing that follows straightforwardly uh, is that the saturation time has to be greater than R over VB, where, where R is defined to be the smallest, sorry, the largest uh, inscribable sphere uh, inside the subregion. So in this case, it would be this width. In the case of a sphere, of course, it's a sphere radius. Um, and this bound can be derived from general principles. Uh, and uh, in all these geometries, these elongated geometries, we get that this bound is actually saturated. And so we learn that black holes uh, often saturate entanglement entropy the fastest allowed by the general rules of quantum mechanics. 
So that's a nice lesson. Um, now, a remarkable thing is that the same membrane theory uh, was also obtained in condensed matter setups. So that really hints towards the universality and general applicability of the membrane theory of entanglement dynamics. So here, uh, people investigated uh, random quantum circuits. So what is a random quantum circuit? Uh, you start uh, from a product state represented by this uh, orange li line. Um, and so these, are, these uh, legs are the spins. Psi naught is the initial state. You, tools, you choose <coughs> two neighboring spins at random. And uh, that's uh, an infinitesimal step of, a of the time evolution. And then you iterate this process and get such a picture. Uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, uh, this is like a tensor network with uh, unitary tensors. And in this framework, there's a simple uh, upper bound on the entropy as a function of time. So, uh, let's take this uh, subregion to be this interval. So it's uh, semi infinite or it ends at the boundary. And, and let's cut through the tensor network. Uh, minimizing over the number of legs cut uh, gives, gives, the, gives an upper bound on the entropy. These authors have shown that in the case of random tensor networks, uh, if we go to this hydrodynamic limit that we've been analyzing, then uh, this cut gets coarse grained, it becomes smooth. Uh, and uh, so we get some picture like this. And it's governed by the same action that we have, uh, that we had from holography, with potentially a different epsilon of V function. <coughs> so that's theory dependent. And based on these observations, John A. Hughes and Nahum um, proposed the membrane phenomenology of entropy dynamics. And now, by now, there are nice analytic arguments in Floquet systems and also evidence in spin chain numerics. Um, so in my mind, this is a remarkable unification of condensed matter and high energy approaches to the same problem of entanglement dynamics. And the unification is this membrane theory that applies both to quantum field theories and random quantum circuits. Um, to test the broad applicability to, of this theory and its robustness uh, with, this, with Julio Virata, uh, we analyzed uh, different extensions and generalizations of this theory. Uh, because, uh, okay, the idea being that if the theory breaks once we only slightly uh, change, then it might be just a coincidence that it works. But that's not the case. It's a very uh, rich and moldable uh, effective theory. So for example, one straightforward thing to consider is to go away from homogeneity and ho consider inhomogeneous quenches. Engage gravity duality, um, fluid flows uh, have uh, bumpy black hole space-time duals. Uh, that's the fluid gravity correspondence. And uh, one can uh, analyze the same problem in that setup. We did that to subleading order in the fluid gra um, gradient expansion. Uh, it, it undertook the same limit as before and got uh, a formally identical action to leading order. And then there are some corrections that I'm not writing here for simplicity. Um, but the, the quantities appearing here are somewhat different than in the homogeneous case. So now the entropy density became space-time dependent, just like in hydrodynamics. So you have to evaluate it wherever the mem at the space-time point, wherever the membrane goes through. And uh, this velocity v is now measured not with respect to uh, the time-like unit vector, but with respect to the four velocity of the fluid. And this is, so we have to first go to the fluid rest frame and determine V there. And then there are some further geometric couplings between the fluid quantities, for example, the shear tensor and the membrane quantities, uh, mostly this, um, this unit normal.
Uh, it's also adaptable to other inhomogeneous setups. For example, we can compute the entanglement entropy of a growing local operator, like in the quantum butterfly effect. So there we have to use the same membrane action, but in a different geometry. In, um, in actually, what we get is that we have to work in this butterfly cone uh, that we analyzed in the first section. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the geometry, two, two butterfly cones, and they are glued together along their faces. And we have to solve the minimal membrane problem in, in that setup. We also analyze joining quenches where there's new objects in the, in the membrane, space, time, and end of the word brain. Uh, we also incorporated subleading corrections in 1 over R and in the holographic language, 1 over coupling corrections, and both can be incorporated into the membrane theory without breaking its structure. This is a new language uh, to analyze problems in entanglement entropy. Uh, we have uh, analyzed new inequalities that can be derived in the time-dependent setting. Holographic entanglement entropy can be reformulated uh, in the language of bit threads. Uh, and uh, we have shown that membrane theory similarly can be reformulated uh, in the language of bit threads. Uh, there are also other information theoretic quantities that can be analyzed, uh, which is work in progress. Um, so the conclusion that I draw from here is that the membrane theory is a versatile theory, has connections to operator growth and hydrodynamics, uh, and has all the features to be a universal theory for all chaotic systems. So let me end uh, with a summary and synthesize this and, and open questions. So as an implicit motivation, I had always hydrodynamics in the back of my mind. It is the effective field theory of transport of conserved densities. Uh, we saw that uh, it showed up in various stages of the discussion. The pole skipping point was a continuation of the hydrodynamic pole uh, of the system. And the, the membrane coupled to hydrodynamic degrees of freedom geometry. Uh, then we we analyzed the the quantum butterfly effect, uh, de derived the refined chaos bound, analyzed explicit examples. The outstanding question is uh, is what the EFT is. Uh, we then uh, demystified pole skipping, and obtained an explicit thermal Green's function in uh, in a specific model. Finally, we derived the membrane theory of endogen dynamics from holography and saw that it uh, uh, saw some evidence for its universality and uh, uh, discussed some applications. So I want to spend some time on emphasizing the role of the butterfly velocity in all this. It, it provides the, one of the first hints of a non-trivial interplay between all these phenomena. Uh, so this relation that the velocity dependent Yapunov exponent uh, vanishes at VB, it is delineates the region in which the OTOC grows whereas, versus the region where it stays small, so this green region. Um, and uh, close to the edge of the butterfly cone, um, uh, the stress tensor dominates chaos. And in that, that case, at least that intermediate or strong coupling. Um, and then it becomes reasonable that the retarded thermal two-point function of the energy density knows about, uh, about, uh, about how the stress tensor contributes to chaos. And uh, this butterfly velocity of the stress tensor shows up in, in, in this correlator through the post skipping phenomenon. VB also showed up in entanglement dynamics, both in uh, the eps this epsilon of V Lagrangian membrane tension curve uh, as this special point and in the saturation time of spherical regions. Finally, I, I only skimmed uh, that there is some bound that we can derive uh, from general principles in like as we did in my paper with Stanford. Um, 
And the membrane theory uh, obeys this bound in a very nice way. We can define a maximal membrane tension uh, with, uh, that satisfies the constraints of con convexity and uh, monotonicity. And that would be a, a membrane tension which uh, linearly interpolates between V and VB. You cannot push it any further up because then it wouldn't be monotonic and convex. And it's, it's simply uh, this linear interpolation. And uh, this membrane theory would actually saturate the bounds uh, that, uh, that we derived. So some open questions. Uh, while in the case of the entanglement dynamics, we, we derived an effective field theory. In the other cases, uh, we are not there yet. Um, and uh, maybe once we get there, we can also unify these effective theories. And some hints are that there was interplay with both hydro and the key role of the butterfly velocity. Uh, I've said this many times, uh, we want an EFT for operator growth. Uh, this membrane theory we just stumbled upon from analyzing examples, both in holography and in random tensor networks. Uh, but it would be good to obtain it from a general EFT reasoning. Just like we can obtain hydrodynamics from uh, just using conservation of stress tensor. And it would be nice to learn how to relate this epsilon of V function to other quantities in the problem, in, in the system. Uh, for example, correlation functions. And the only point which we know, which we can determine independently is this, uh, is this point where epsilon of where this function epsilon touches the 45 degree line at VB because we can compute VB from correlation functions. But we don't know of a way to uh, read off epsilon of V from something else. There's a slogan in this community uh, that gravity is the hydrodynamics of entanglement. Uh, and it would be really fascinating if. Uh, uh, one could somehow derive GR uh, from this membrane theory. So far we are, that's a, a far away dream. Um, we can only reconstruct the static black hole geometry in this sliver uh, from, uh, for, from the membrane theory. Uh, but to get GR, we would need dynamics and so on. Um, so, an Im interesting question uh, is the implications for holographic RG, which is the idea that the extra dimension in holography um, is uh, the geometrization of RG scale. So, as you go, this is this would be the UV of the geometry, and as you go deeper along uh, space. Uh, along different uh, uh, slices um, you go deeper and deeper in in energy scale in the into the ir in the field theory uh, that certainly works very nicely outside of horizons but here we were analyzing entanglement dynamics at the longest possible uh, time scales and uh, and spatial scales and uh, all of these green sliver in the space time contributed equally uh, to this problem. So that indicates that uh, this organization according to RG scale breaks down behind horizons. And finally, uh, uh, the close connection of the membrane theory to tensor networks hints at some, um, uh, or gives some hints towards the tensor network approaches to holography. So one uh, problem that plugs those approaches is that in uh, time dependent uh, space times, uh, different, so even if we consider uh, subregions in the boundary on the same uh, time, at the same time, but different shapes, the corresponding extremal surfaces will probe different slices on, in the geometry and you cannot put them on the same Cauchy slides. Uh, 
and the usual idea of uh, of tensor network approaches to holography uh, wants to say that somehow uh, some preferred spatial slice through the bot is uh, what determines the tensor networks or tensor network or where the tensor network lives. Instead, here we integrated out the bulk radial direction, and that's how we obtain uh, a tensor network like description. Uh, so that just says that you need to reprocess the bulk geometry before you can get a quantitative tensor network like description. And with that, I would like to thank for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. So uh, thank you for giving such a elaborative, nice talk. And uh, uh, I would ask, uh, I, I think a lot of people left because it is a very long talk, I can understand. So if you have any question, please ask. Just before that, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Mark for giving such a nice talk. Thank you. And please uh, ask question if you have anything to ask specifically, or you can also contact Mark after seeing the talk. Or if you have anything specifically, you can ask himself by writing an email as well. He will give the answer. And uh, yeah, like Abhinash, you want to ask anything? Um, no, no, uh, I don't have anything to ask. No, thanks for the nice talk, though. Okay. So um, thank you, Mark, for uh, your talk and uh, contribution. And uh, we hope uh, you will stay uh, happy, healthy, and things will be get. Uh, uh, fine very soon and I can see that you are working right now from your office and I hope this will continue thank you yeah I wish all the best to everybody yeah thanks so see you bye and this will be posted in YouTube I will share the link with you okay, okay. yeah bye bye